Thank you very much. My name is Emily Saunderson. I'm a barrister at Quadrant Chambers and I specialise in commercial litigation with a focus on banking and fraud. The title of this Qubit talk is What is the Rule Against Reflective Loss? So let me just give you a bit of an overview as to where I'm going to go with this talk. Firstly, I'll tell you what the rule is. I'll give you an example of the rule so you can see how it might work in practice. I'm going to warn you about a few points that you might need to look out for when you're thinking about whether the rule applies to your particular case or not. And finally, I'll run through some routes to recovery if you find yourself faced with a claim that you think is going to be barred by the rule against reflective loss. So firstly, what is the rule? Well, it's a rule of company law, and it's all about who can recover a certain type of loss. So in broad terms, it arises where there are three parties. There's a company, there's a shareholder in the company, and there's a wrongdoer. Now, the wrongdoer, who is often but not always a director of the company, commits a wrong against the company and causes the company loss. As a result of the loss suffered by the company, the shareholder also suffers loss because the value of his or her shares reduces or the dividends that he or she can recover from the company are reduced. The rule against reflective loss is that even where the shareholder has got a claim against the wrongdoer, the shareholder can't sue the wrongdoer for the diminution in the value of his or her shares or for any loss of dividends, as long as the company can bring a claim against the wrongdoer for that loss. So it's a rule of company law and it's referred to as reflective loss because it's said that the loss of the shareholder simply reflects the loss that's been suffered by the company. And it flows from an 1843 case called Foss and Harbottle. And the rule in Foss and Harbottle is basically that the only person that can seek relief for an injury done to a company where the company's got a claim in respect of that damage is the company itself. So let me give you an example, because it's always easier to see how things might work when you've got an example. So say you've got two people, Jack and Jill, and they've got an absolutely amazing recipe for muffins. And they decide to set up a bakery business. They decide to set up a company, let's call it Marvelous Muffins Limited. And they enter into a shareholders agreement. And under the shareholders agreement, they agree that Marvelous Muffins Limited is going to own this incredible muffin recipe and they are going to keep it secret. So the business starts up and it's a roaring success. You've got muffins flying off the shelves like hot muffins. And the business does phenomenally well. It's raking in money hand over fist. Some way down the line, there's a falling out and Jack decides he can't stand the sight of Jill anymore and he has to get out of the business. So he sells his shares. Not only does he sell his shares, but he goes off and sets up a rival company and in breach of the shareholders agreement, he uses the secret muffin recipe. The rival company does fantastically well and actually starts taking business away from Marvelous Muffins Limited. And it continues and it continues and eventually Marvelous Muffins Limited is left with nothing. So you've got Jill stuck with a company that is worth nothing and you've got Jack who's breached the shareholders agreement and has got all this business in his new company. Now the rule against reflective loss means that as long as Marvelous Muffins Limited can bring a claim against Jack for the loss of its value, Jill can't enforce the shareholders agreement against Jack. She can't bring that claim for the loss of her value in her business. Now that might seem like a very harsh rule. So are there any exceptions? Well the short answer is no, there aren't any exceptions. But there are a few things that you will probably want to bear in mind when you're thinking about whether this applies to any given situation. The first point is that for the rule to apply, the company has to have a claim against the wrongdoer. So if the company doesn't have a claim but the shareholder does, there's nothing wrong with the shareholder pursuing the wrongdoer directly. Secondly, the rule only applies to shareholders. It doesn't apply to creditors. So if you're a creditor of a company, if you've loaned a company money, and the director of the company has come in and asset stripped the company, which means the company can't repay you, if you as the creditor can find a way to proceed directly against the wrongdoer, that's absolutely fine. The rule only applies to shareholders. Thirdly, there's been a suggestion in the Court of Appeal case called Broadcasting Investment Group Limited and Smith that the rule might not apply to claims for specific performance. 
So if, for example, you've got a shareholders agreement and you want specific performance of that agreement rather than damages, you may well as a shareholder be able to go for specific performance. What was said in Broadcasting Investment Group, though, was obiter dicta. So you might find yourself with the right claim, the right facts, going all the way to, to the Supreme Court if you need that point deciding. Now, there are two key cases you need to know about. I'll mention them just by name so you know in case you have to go and do any research into this area. The first one is Prudential and Newman. It's a 1982 Court of Appeal case. And the second is Marex Financial Limited and Sevilleca, which is a 2020 Supreme Court case and that dealt with the position as regards creditors, but contained lots of useful analysis of the rule in general terms. So, what are the options for shareholders who suffer this sort of a loss, but they haven't got a claim against the wrongdoer? What are the roots out of there? Well, the reason a shareholder can't bring the claim is because the loss is regarded as the company's loss. So perhaps the first and obvious question is, can you persuade the company to go after the wrongdoer to recover that loss? Now, the problem often is that the wrongdoer is a director of the company. So you've got a big roadblock sitting in the way of your claim and the director is stopping the company bringing a claim against him or her. If that's the case, you could try to bring a derivative claim. Now, a derivative claim is a claim under Section 260 of the Companies Act and it's a claim against a director in negligence or breach of duty or breach of trust. Um, it's a rather involved process to bring this sort of claim because you as a shareholder can't just launch an action in the name of the company. You need the court's permission to do it. So if you're looking at this sort of action, you have to be prepared for it to be a slightly longer, more difficult process than just a straightforward claim. The potential upside with a derivative claim is that if you can persuade a court that you have the right to bring the claim, the court will often make an order that the company pays the costs of the claim rather than the shareholder. So, Second option. Another potential issue when you've got a company looking to bring a claim against the wrongdoer is the wrongdoer has done something so bad to the company that the company hasn't got the means to bring the claim. It's been asset stripped or it's been left insolvent. So in that case, you might want to consider offering to fund the company to bring the claim or taking an assignment of the claim from the company so you can bring the claim yourself in the name of the company. If the company is still solvent, a third option might be an unfair prejudice petition under Section 994 of the Companies Act. Now, Section 994 applies when a shareholder can show that the company's affairs have been conducted in a way that's unfairly prejudicial to that shareholder, or that something has been done or will be done that's going to unfairly prejudice the position of that shareholder. And the court has got a very broad discretion as to the relief it can grant under Section 996 of the Companies Act, but the usual order is that the petitioner's shares are brought out for fair value. Finally, if the facts are right, and depending on who the wrongdoer is, you might look at winding up the company on the just and equitable ground under Section 1221G of the Insolvency Act. And it might be appropriate to go for a winding up order um, if the wrongdoer is a director and they have behaved in such a way that you can say justifiably that there's been a loss of confidence in the management of the company, it, for example, if there's been a fraud committed by the director. Now, that won't immediately give you a way to recover the loss, but you could perhaps work with the liquidator to get the liquidator to bring a claim directly against the director, if the director is the wrongdoer, to try and get the money back in the company so you can make some sort of recovery. Or it might enable you to take an assignment of the claim. So that's the rule against reflective loss and some potential routes around it. Thank you very much.